we'll buy them. We'll buy them a kit, and then they can make them, and they can see your samples and see what you guys do. And, you know, we want to show you how to be to work. It was a serious thing. In our basement, he had bought an aluminum track. 40 foot, two still got it? For the digital time. No, I don't. I saw it all. Man. I was watching them build them tracks on the top. Not competitive. See? You, had no. to, you had a digital ending where the... Yeah. Man, that's what they do now in the state. They have yeah. digital readings. Oh, yeah. They'll tell you exactly when it goes across. They have scales that they weigh your car yeah. before you go on. Yeah, he had it all. Wow. Yeah. It was, yeah. it had the, the men had their own open class, too. They got really crazy. <laughs> He thrown like a three-year state champion down there. So. Wow. He wasn't very happy with it. Now I know what the design of the car was. You know, it's always a certain way you put it on. You know, the Mike's like, you got to pull the wheels out a certain way, right? When you Let everybody else up. put their cars on first. Yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe when we get ready to do that, you can come in and help us. Oh, I'd love to. Okay. You can show the kids how to do it the right way and take it the right way. Put the wheels on the right way. Yeah. That'd be perfect. Thanks, guys.
better, I guess we better do something. All right. Jerry's like, what's going on up there, man? <laughs> that you're here with us. Uh, just a few things as we begin uh, this morning. Um, <clears throat> we do have a new ministry called Friend to Friend. Um, this is a ministry started up uh, by uh, one of our parishioners here. And um, Judy Hartzell has just had a heart for wanting to connect uh, people who aren't connected to the church, who are home um, due to maybe being unable to come physically or uh, kind of at home alone during the week uh, because they don't have a lot of family or anybody around, especially some of our senior adults. And so um, she has a sign-up sheet out in the Welcome Center. And if you know any person that would just kind of benefit from some people coming to visit and spending some time with them, please uh, uh, put that name down there and she can get in contact with you. If you want to more information about it or you might be interested in doing that, um, I can point you in the direction of Judy. We want to make sure we kind of um, not just put anybody in the group to just go visit. We want to make sure that everybody who goes um, is able to do the visits and do it in a proper way. And so, uh, but we have this new ministry that's starting. It's really exciting. And uh, if you want more information, come see me and I can point you in the direction of Judy Hartzell. 
We have a baptism service coming up August 14th for anybody who wants to be baptized. Um, if you have questions about baptism, come see me. Um, I'll definitely answer any questions that you have and sign you up if you want to be a part of our baptism service on August 14th. We will also have kind of a uh, youth um, fundraiser afterwards uh, on the 14th, August 14th, uh, in the um, foyer area. Uh, so be looking out for more information on that. Royal Rangers are going to begin here August 25th. And uh, we're going to actually go ahead. And we've had a lot of people in different age ranges. And uh, Mike's trying to figure this out a little bit. So he says, go ahead. If you're anywhere from kindergarten up to, to 12th grade, Go ahead and sign up on the list if you have a boy that would be interested in being a part of our Royal Rangers. And uh, our first meeting is August 25th at 6.30. That's a Thursday. Um, so we'd love to see you come out and be a part of our Royal Rangers uh, new um, initiative here at the church, new ministry. Finally, before we go to the call to worship and we worship, I want to just say a thank you uh, to Cheney Canada. Um, what an amazing uh, young lady she has been back in our sound booth. It has been amazing to see you uh, just take on that ministry and uh, go about being a part of our sound booth and sound tech and all the countless hours. She was here before most people would show up on Sunday morning to set everything up. She was here for all of our uh, events as, as much as she could with a busy schedule with so many things jam-packed in it. And uh, I'm very thankful um, for the work you've done there. And we're going to miss you but we're excited to see how college is going to go for you and we'll be praying for you. And I just wanted to say thank you, Cheney. With that, let's stand. Simply our call to worship is let everything that has breath praise the Lord. We have breath, so let's praise the Lord this morning with our songs. Amen. Whoa, 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 whoa.
going to do a little something special um, this morning for our uh, call to prayer. If you'll please stand. Um, I'm going to ask Terry Fisher to come up. Um, I don't know if uh, you know this or not. We've been praying for Terry. Um, the doctors had said that they had found a tumor um, in his brain, and we began to pray. And uh, this morning, Terry wants to share you some news that he got uh, from the doctor. I want to thank you all for your prayers. They can't find the tumor anywhere in my brain. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank you all. Immediately when he said that he had the tumor, that's what we prayed. We began to pray, say, Lord, Lord, let them go back in and find nothing. And when they went back in, they found nothing. The Lord answers prayer. And so this morning, if there is something in your life, something you're struggling with, something you're dealing with, God does listen, and God does answer prayers. It may take some time because it's in his timing and in his will, but God does answer prayers. And so this morning, come forward. If you have something you just want to lay before God this morning, come this morning and lay it at his feet because he hears and he cares and he will work. Amen.
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, most gracious God, we thank you for this day. Lord, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your holiness, dear Lord. We thank you that you're a God of justice. You're a God who is all-seeing, all-knowing, all-present. You're a God who cares for us, who created us and made us. We thank you, dear Lord. And Lord, I thank you for those who are standing before me, those who are nailed here at the cross and nailed here at the altar, dear Lord, and those who are watching on Facebook right now. Lord, whatever it may be in their hearts, whatever they may be struggling with, whatever they may be dealing with, Lord, dear Lord, I just pray right now that you would work in each of these issues, each of these problems, each of these concerns and worries, dear Lord. And Lord, that they might see you work in a mighty way and glorify your name. We thank you so much, dear Lord, for answering our prayers for Terry. And we give you praise today because we know it was you who worked through this. Lord, be with us in the remaining part of the service that we might just take away all the distractions and all the things that are causing us issues and problems, Lord, and all the other things that we're focused in. And Lord, just focus in on you, that we might hear your word, and Lord, we might be transformed by it. Not by anything that I have ever said or will say, but Lord, that your word be proclaimed. In Jesus' name, amen. True. 
Aren't you glad you're a child of God? You may be seated. If you have your Bibles and you'd like to turn along, we're going to be in the book of 1 Samuel today. That's 1 Samuel, and we're going to be in chapter 16. Chapter 16 this morning. All right, I will say something really positive this morning about you guys. A lot of you did not comment as I was wondering if you were going to on my outfit today. So very good for you not doing that, but truth check here. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna check our hearts here. Who kind of struggled with my outfit this morning? Raise your hand. Okay, there's a, there's a few. Good. You're being honest. Those who aren't, you know, we can talk about it later if the Holy Spirit convicts you and we can talk about that at, at a different time. Believe me, this morning was not easy dressing like this. Honestly, I, I, I had reserved thoughts all the way up until putting this on and even getting here this morning, I had a little anxiety. I mean, it's just a shirt. It's just shorts. It's just sandals. But I struggled with it just as much as you did. You know, the reason I struggled with it is because, you know, typically pastors don't wear shorts and t-shirts. You know, I push the limits, I know as it is, with my jeans and my polo shirts every week or my uh, crazy designed uh, uh, button-up shirts. I still wear pink. I'm sorry, Mike. I still wear pink. I know. I know. But I struggled as well with it. And, and I almost was going to not do this as, as an illustration this morning as we began. And then I got talking to somebody. Um, I, I got talking to a gentleman who's not in our area. Um, but he's a guy who has not gone to church for many, many years. Many, many years because people look at him and judge him in the area that he's at. He can't go into a church without people looking down or at least feeling like they are looking down on him. Partly because of his past, partly because of his dress. 
And I hear his heart and I hear him talking and I hear a guy who is truly wanting to be a part of a community who's truly wanting to hear God's word and truly trying to change and do what Jesus Christ has called him to do, and yet he feels like he cannot be a part of a church community. That breaks my heart. I grew up wearing suits and ties (laughs) when I was a kid. And even when I first got here, I wore Suits and ties and dress shirts, dress pants and stuff. And I don't do it just to be trendy or cool. I don't care. I'm not cool. I know it. I'm okay with it. I've made, I've made my peace with that, you know. I'm weird and wacky, and that's who I am. You want the Fonzie of the bunch, that's who I am, the Fozzie the bear. You want the Fozzie of the bear. Not Fonzie. I'm definitely not Fonzie, but I'm Fozzie. You know, I'm the Fozzie of the bunch. I'm okay with that. Waka, 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 all right? I'm okay with that. But as a pastor, I'm more concerned with wanting to reach at the level of people who are with me. And the reason I want to reach that is because I want people to understand it's not about how you look, how you dress, about the world standards, but what is going on in your heart and allowing God to work in that situation. There was a king, and he had all the opportunities to be the king of Israel, to have his dynasty last forever and ever and ever, and he failed because he did not follow after God. And when God removed him, he chose another, another that he said would be after his own heart. And this morning, we're going to talk about this king, this King David, one we all know about. We're going to talk about how he was anointed and what happened when he was anointed king and kind of get an impression of what God is most concerned about this morning. So let's take a look at the text as we start. It says, then the Lord said to Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill the horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. But Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears about it, he will kill me. The Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to sacrifice to the sacrifice, and I will show you what to do. You are to anoint for me the one I indicate. Samuel did what the Lord said. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled when they met him. They asked, Do you come in peace? Samuel replied, Yes, in peace. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they had arrived, Samuel saw Elib and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed stands here before me. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse called Anadab and had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, the Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse has Shammam. Uh, passed by and Samuel said, nor has the Lord chosen him, uh, chosen this one. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel, but Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, are you, are these all the sons you have? There is still the youngest, Jesse answered. He is tending the sheep. 
Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent for him and had him brought in. He was the glowing, uh, he was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil, anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. Samuel went to Ramah. May God add his blessing to the reading of the scripture this morning. Samuel looks with man's eyes. He sees the firstborn, this first son coming in, strong, big in stature. This surely has to be the king. This surely is the one that God's going to choose. But it wasn't. It's very interesting when Samuel goes out to do this. Um, this is a little side point here. When he goes out to anoint uh, God's chosen for the king. Um, he went out there. He was a little concerned about Saul finding out that he was going out there. We see this little interaction. I want to give you kind of a little bit of a background of why he was so concerned. Well, Samuel was the only one who could go and anoint a king. So if he broke where he usually went with his circuit, which Bethlehem was outside his circuit, Saul would really know that something was going on and that he was going to go ahead and uh, be anointing another king. So he was afraid of for his life that he was going to do this. And God gave him a workaround. Now, why did he tell him to go take a heifer? Well, it wasn't uh, out of the, um, pers- uh, it wasn't out of uh, a place for Samuel, if there was maybe a murder on a land to go and do a sacrifice to cleanse and consecrate that land. And so uh, God tells him to take that heifer so it wouldn't look like there was something going on and gives him an out to be able to, to watch over Samuel and, and work with Samuel's fears. And I think that's one of the things we have to understand. God's works with our faults. Samuel should have trusted that God would, would watch over him. But, I mean, we get concerned, don't we, you know? Nobody wants to, the, the king to think that he's going to go and uh, anoint another king and kill, you know, kill him, you know? And so uh, Samuel is faithful, but God is even more faithful because he can even work with our faults. And that's a neat thing to realize as we go deeper into this, into this passage, that we get so focused on our faults, that we think we can't do anything. And God works around it. Samuel invites Jesse and his sons to the sacrifice to anoint the king. And once again, he sees Elam and he says, sure enough, this is the king. This is surely God's chosen person for the king. God speaks to Samuel and says, no. Look, this is not the one that's going to be king. And in fact, all the sons pass by, and none of them are what God is looking for. I think we often do the same thing as Samuel does. We often look with the world's view of success, the world's view of beauty and handsomeness. We look at the world's view of successful traits We look at the world and and what the world has to say, and we often let that world around us define who we are, limit who we are. And sure enough, Satan gets right in there with it because he's going to take that and he's going to take it even further than it goes to think you're not good enough, you're not smart enough, you're not capable enough that your circumstances and the things that you did in your past, you can't get beyond it, you can't go forward in it. We look at ourselves in comparison with others and the world standards. I think a lot of times in life, God wants to do some amazing things, but we limit ourselves because we look at ourselves through the lenses, the lenses of the world rather than what God sees. 
I got a new fashion statement uh, pair of glasses today. All right. I'm going to try to be cool now, okay? I'm going to tell you, I put this on right before service. This is the first time I really put this thing on. Right now, I feel like I can fall over. I mean, seriously, this is, it messes so much. But we look in, we look in the mirror and we look at ourselves with the lenses of the world and we're so distorted and we can't truly see who God's really called us to be. Isaac, you want to come forward this morning? Are you okay to come forward? No? Okay, you don't have to. I'll, I'll get somebody else this morning. Janie, will you come forward? All right. Right there, I, I marked, just like everybody else, I marked so that they can see on the camera. Put those on and take a look in that mirror and tell me what you see or what you can't see. You can't see the mirror. You see all kinds of like uh, multiple refractions, refractions exactly, because it's Clyde. So thank you. I wanted to make sure you knew that I was being honest that you can't see with these things. So that's what it is when we look, we look at ourselves through the world's definition of what we are and who we are. We're often so hard on ourselves. And we're so worried about our looks and our dress and the way we are perceived by people. And it causes anxiety, causes depression, causes us not to really be able to do and be what God has called us to be. And here's the sad thing. Not only do we do that to ourselves, but we look at others in comparison with ourselves and the world standards. How many times you say, well, at least I'm not that person. Or at least I didn't dress like the pastor did this morning. At least I had a little <laughs> bit more respect. And then, folks, we even go further. Christians looking with the law without grace. Internally to ourselves, we look at ourselves with the law and how we don't stand up to God's measure we think because we think of God in the law sense rather than in God in the grace sense. And we look at others in the same way. Well, if they were Christians, they would be like this. Or they're coming to church, they should look like that or look like this. Or, you know, why can't, why can't you stop doing what you're doing because you know that's wrong and that's sinful and you are just, you should just stop it. Amen. And not realize the same thing we're doing, just in a different way. Amen. We don't look at the sins that we're doing and the things that we're doing and allow God to transform our hearts, but we look at others. You see, God sees beyond the outward appearance. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Just a few verses before when he rebuked Saul, God said this, I'm looking for a man after my own heart, or as the passage says there, a man after his own heart. He selects the youngest, the one out in the field tending to the sheep, the ones that didn't even think about calling in, you know, think about poor David out there by himself. Have you ever been called late for dinner? I mean, literally, he was called late for dinner there. He was late, called late to come in for the supper. And yet, he's the youngest. He's out there tending to the sheep. They didn't even think about it till the last bit where Samuel's like, okay, we're at the end here. You got any more sons? You hiding somebody in the back? Where, 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 what's going on here? And they bring David. Now, I will say he was healthy and he was handsome, okay? So he had a little bit going for him, but he wasn't like that first son. 
Because in that culture, in that day, typically you're going to choose the eldest son. The eldest son is going to be the one who is selected by the world standards. He's the one to get the best of the inheritance. He's the one who's to get the blessing. But with God, God was looking for the one whose heart would follow him. He would be king because he knew David would follow after him. Consider Jesus for a moment as we're talking about this. You think of David was not the most, uh, he was not the number one draft choice of, uh, of the people around him, but he was God's number one draft pick. Consider Jesus for a moment. Jesus, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the King that is beyond all kings, the King, he grew up before him like a tender shoot, like a root out of the dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that he should, we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar to pain, like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised, and we held him in low esteem. He came in a manger where other kings would have come and been born in a palace. He lived among common folk. He, risked, he resisted any attempts by people who were trying to thrust him into the kingship early because they had distorted views of what the kingship should be, and they had distorted views of what the Messiah was coming to do. They had distorted views of what Israel was supposed to be. He made outcast his disciples. He took time to talk to and help those who were marginalized by society in that day and that age. Was not the king that most people thought would be. But he came to save us. He came for us. God does not look at our society and the things of our society. He does not come to look at our standards or the world standards or thing. He is above that because guess what? He's the creator of this universe and the creator of this world. He's created us. He knows us. He knows us well farther than any person could ever know us in our lives, even ourselves. And he came in order that we might Live for him and have eternal life. He didn't look. Because imagine if Jesus came with the world's views, came to be the best looking, best dressed, best king, that we hang out with the Pharisees and to look down at those that were around. Would that be a God that you would want to have a part with and in? We need to look at others and ourselves with God's eyes. We need to take off this world's goggles of, and, you, and, and if you want to take a look at this after service, I'll have them here if you want to take a look at them. You, you'll definitely be interested to see that. But we got to take off the world's goggles, the world's looks of what it is to look at ourselves in this reflection of the world and look at us what God looks at us because when we begin to look at ourselves as God looks at us, we realize that we are dearly loved children of his. One of my favorite passages, I love this passage from John 3, 1. It says, see what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is the reason, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. I love that word, lavished. It's not just like, you know, God loves you. 
Huh? God cares about you. God lavished us with love, with the deepest, fullest that he could go, lavished us with his love and called children of God that we are his children. Psalmist says, for you created my inmost being. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully, fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you. I was made in a secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. It's not just the fact that God loves us, but he created us. He made us wonderfully, and, and he made us perfectly. Now, I know we have blemishes. I know we have deformities, and those things come not from God. God made us wonderfully and imperfectly. It's from sin and sin's effect on the world. But God can even work through those imperfections in our lives. He can even work through them in order that we can do great things for him. But we have to see ourselves as God sees us. Not to be bold for or, or uh, proud or anything of that sort. But to say, you know what, God made me who I am. He had a purpose of why he made me this way. And God loves me dearly. Whether the world cares about me or not, I have a heavenly father who loves me. My self-esteem and my self-worth is not put in anything but God himself. And I can tell you as a pastor who's dealt with self-esteem issues from a very young age until even now. When I get my eyes off of God's view of me, I struggle and deal with self-worth because I take a look at the world and what the world thinks of me and says about me, or the world, I think the world thinks about me, and in the world's terms, it'll drive me crazy. But then God redirects me back. And I look at God and I say, okay, God, I am made by you and loved by you. And that is the standard that I should look at in my life. Amen. I can do these things not because I'm the best speaker in the world, but because you speak through me and I allow you to speak through me. Amen. That you have a purpose for me to be here, a purpose for me to be where I'm at. And God can do the same thing for you. God wants us to stop looking at others and looking at ourselves by the world standards. And it's the same thing when we look at someone else. Stop looking at people because of their age, the way they dress, the way their hair may be what they may have done in their past. We're not the judge. Only God is the judge. We got to love people. We got to let people know that they do matter. Because there's a world out there that's telling them they're not good enough. They're not smart enough. There's a world out there that is just tearing people down. And all they're looking for is someone to say, hey, you matter. It doesn't matter what your background was. It doesn't matter who you were. You matter. Amen. And I'm here and I love you and I care for you. And God wants people with hearts after his own. So many of us try to be perfectionists with Christianity. 
We try to be so perfect, uh, perfectionist with it that we forget the grace part and we get into the law. And that's called legalism. And that's not what God has called us to do. He wants gods that are after his own heart. So he does want us to be holy. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. James says, do not merely listen to the word so you deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in the mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives us freedom and continues in it, not forgetting that they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they're doing. I want you to take a minute and think about this because he says the perfect law. What is the perfect law? What is the perfect law? Our district superintendent put a wonderful little clip out there. He gave me a little sermon illustration right there as I was looking at his, uh, at his Facebook page this week. So Dr. Gorvette, this is, this, is, this is your words here, and you're taking it also from John Wesley. So this is his take on what John Wesley says. So we're going to put it up on the screen here. I want to hold it there for a few minutes, okay, because it's a little small. So if you want to try to read, um, to read it a little bit. Wesley argued that holiness, Christian perfection, is nothing more or less than perfect love. It is loving, it's love excluding sin, love filling the heart, taking up the whole capacity of the soul. It is love rejoicing evermore, praying without ceasing, in everything giving thanks. The letter of the law isn't trying to, to do a scoreboard. Well, I, I sinned here today. I think I sinned here today. I, I, I may have had a thought here today that could have been a sin, or I'm worried about that sin. Um, or, you know, I told a little white lie here today. Will God forgive me? Will God care for me? That's not holiness. Holiness is loving God so much with your heart and, and growing in that love and allowing God's love to fill you so that you can love God with all of your heart as the best that you can with the capacity that you can and to love others the same way. That is holiness. If you're loving God and you're loving people as best as you can, you're on the right path to holiness. You're on the right path. So that goes to the second thing after God's own heart, love. And so we know that and know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. There you go. Once again, that holiness idea. This is how love is made complete among us that we will have confidence on the judgment uh, on the day of judgment in this world we are like Jesus there is no fear in love there is no fear in love if you're in the uh, love you don't have to worry about the fear anymore because you're in his perfect love and you're loving from his love who uh, <laughs> give me a second here I got, I got ramped up like I usually do. <laughs> but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. Now that's something to be concerned about if you're going to be concerned about anything in the holiness For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he gave us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. Jesus said, the second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. We want to be a man after God's own heart. 
and a woman after God's own heart, then we have to allow God's love to fill us in order that we can love other people. Humility. I could take a whole time, but we're getting close to a time again. We're getting close to 10 o'clock, but I could take you. Read Philippians 2, one of my favorite passages as well. Tells about how Jesus, who was God himself, realized he couldn't relate to us in the sense that we couldn't relate to him in the way he was. So he took on full humanity. And when he took on full humanity, he didn't just take on full humanity. He came as a servant to serve. And not just as a servant to serve. He went fully to the cross and took the punishment of us on him. He didn't have to do that. He humbled himself. And because he humbled himself that way, he has the name above all names. We have to have humility if we want to have a heart after God's own heart. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. Humility. Mercy and forgiveness. Be merciful just as your father is merciful. Do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. There's a clause there. So forgive me for my outfit today, okay? Will you forgive me for this? I won't wear this again. Well, I can't say that. Maybe again. I want to put that clause in there just in case. But forgiveness, mercy, that's what God is about. He wouldn't have sent his son if he wasn't going to show us mercy and forgiveness. So show mercy and forgiveness, not only to others, but yourself as well. Sometimes we can be our own hardest critic and our own hardest judge. And if God has shown you mercy and forgiveness, what right do we have to not show ourselves mercy and forgiveness as well? And then finally, to trust him completely. A man after God's own heart and a woman after God's own heart is going to trust God fully. Going to go wherever God has called them to do, realizing that even though we may not think we have the capability or the skills or the things to do what God has called us to do, to realize God does not make us make a mistake. And when God calls us to do something, and when God has called us into something, he is going to give us what we need to be able to do it. To stop looking at the world's view of, well, I can't do this because I'm not, I'm not a holy saint. You don't have to be a holy saint. In fact, you are saints. When you have asked for forgiveness, you have become a saint. You are a saint. You may not feel like a saint some days. I know how it is. But you're a saint. And God has called you to service and to work. Stop looking at yourself and real, at, at, at the world standards and realize if the world hates you, if all the world hates you, guess what? There's still one person who loves you. Amen. And that is the one person that matters. Amen. And that's God. Amen. And to realize love is the key to holiness. Strive for love in your life, to love others, and to love God as best to your capabilities. And believe me, God will help you all the way through. Heavenly Father, most gracious God, I thank you for this day. I thank you for your blessings. I thank you for each person who has come out today. Lord, I thank you for your love and your mercy. Help us to be your hands and feet this week as we go out. And Lord, bring us back next week so we can praise you once again. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.